this hangout on air is live. So, so we're, we're good. We're doing this, huh? We're doing it right now. And it's it should uh, auto-tweet out a link to the video, too. Um, so we'll see if that actually works or not. But, uh, okay. but yeah. Yep, it did. Episode 2 is streaming live. Cool. So, yeah. Um, I guess let's just start out with a little bit of your background. Kind of, you know, that's how I guess I got to come in contact with you was, I believe, on LinkedIn just because you had had more of a design background um, and I thought it was really cool what you were doing. So do you just want to give us a little Thanks. backstory? Yeah, totally. Um, so my name is John Miller. Um, I am founder of Backcountry United. I, uh, you know, this whole thing has kind of come about from a lifelong passion for action sports, snowboarding, art, design. Um, and so I've kind of been on this journey since childhood and it all kind of came together to where I'm at right now. Um, so, you know, I was actually born in Salt Lake city and kind of had the mountains, like right the Cottonwood canyons, like right out the window of my grandparents' house and, and grew up uh, in Northwest Colorado, like close to steamboat Springs and started snowboarding in the mid eighties and uh, just really found my passion uh, in the mountains, you know, for as long as I can remember. And, um, and then, you know, I lived in a, uh, kind of a blue collar coal mining ranch town and I was one of three skateboarders and, um, you know, we, we were kind of, you know, going against the grain even back then as kids. And I wanted to be an artist and, um, a lot of people told me like, you can't do that. You know, like nobody goes and, makes money like doing art like go get a job at the coal mine or, or <laughs> something like that and um so really it was like art was my initial career push and um i went to college uh in glenwood springs um studied graphic design and was really just a snowboard bum and uh you know but i knew i had to do something more than just get an associate's degree and kind of hack away like in print shop land and um so i moved to denver and went to art school studied illustration and um just through my network there kind of grew and i got into the advertising industry and um started working at an agency in denver uh the integer group and we were doing a lot of coors uh family of brands type of merchandising and, and promotional advertising and such. And um, so I was working as a graphic designer, illustrator in the studio. And, um, but the whole time I, I really wanted to get into snowboarding and I wasn't sure like how that fit in or where that was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, it was just kind of a, I guess an inkling in the back of my head that I wanted to do someday. And, um, and so I actually tried to get out of advertising around like 03, 04, and made a big push to get into the skateboard industry. Um, and that was right on the heels of, of a small stint of having uh, Airwalk as a client, where I was actually seeing people that were making a living working in action sports, and it gave me a little bit of inspiration to, to try my hand at it, you know. And, um, so I, I had some interviews. I went out to San Francisco for a pretty cool opportunity and um, when I was flying home uh, it was like the first big storm um, and it was blue skies and I'm flying over the Rockies and I'm looking out the window of the plane and just like what am I doing I can't move to California I need to stay here you know so that kind of kept me in Colorado um, I turned down the opportunity at a pretty reputable skateboard company and um, just stuck it out, stayed at the agency, and uh, I guess 04 had an opportunity to work on some new business at the agency, which was uh, Polaris Industries, and um, just kind of got my foot in the door on the Polaris account and, and uh, was one of the original team members as that account started to grow. Um, so I spent the next 10 years really focusing on um, – Polaris, like snowmobiles, ATVs, and uh, motorcycles and stuff like that. 
with a, a big focus on the snowmobile side of things. And, um, so just, uh, that kind of kept going. And, you know, the thing that always kept me interested in snowmobiles was, went back to my early, my teen years when, uh, some of my friends who were pro snowboarders at the time had sleds and we'd go out into the back country and build jumps and dork around and ride powder and stuff. And, um, so it was always one of those things that I wanted, but it was like one of those things that like rich people have that I just <laughs> never thought that I could have something like that. And so it was really kind of a Holy grail that I didn't really get an opportunity to get into when I was younger. And, um, you know, what better way to get into it now working in the business. And, um, and, and so really from the beginning, I wanted to connect uh, snowboarding with snowmobile industry. Um, you know, selfishly, I just wanted to go out and shoot cool <laughs> videos with, you know, some of my action sports heroes and, um, you know, and the, the industry just wasn't ready for it yet. Um, and so really that was, that was kind of the, the, cross that I bore like bared the whole time I really wanted to just bring snowboarding into snowmobiling and um, I think people were kind of sick of hearing about it <laughs> toward <laughs> the, the end of my decade of that career um, but I just kept pushing it and pushing it and um, you know just I had a really hard time like getting executives to pay attention to this opportunity and, and seeing it as a real market growth potential and um, and so, you know, Backcountry United kind of came about because I saw, I was connected to all these different pieces of content where, um, you know, ski, snowboard, action sports, uh, I mean, shoot, mountain biking, you know, pretty much anything that Red Bull would go out and produce. I was, I was watching the content and um, you know, connected to the communities of, of each of these segments of action sports and, um, and snowmobiling. And so I just kind of wanted to see, you know, test my theory that, that these worlds can kind of intermingle and collaborate. And so I started a Facebook page to just bring it all into one place, bring the content of snowboarding, skiing, snowmobiling all into one place. And, um, and I started to get a little bit of traction and I made a logo that, that, you know, kind of told the story a little bit. And, yeah. um, so it just started a brand really as a Facebook page and, and that started to, um, crystallize some of my ideas and language and just how I talked about like bringing these cultures together. And, um, but I really had no plan for it. I just knew I wanted to build an audience and kind of prove that this, this insight was there. Um, around the same time I uh, made the, my first trip out to Alaska, uh, with a couple of my buddies, um, guy, Randy Sherman, who's a kind of a pioneer, um, snowmobiler who grew up in Alaska on Thompson pass, uh, with his friends snowmobiling. So he and his group of friends were really like, pioneers of big mountain snowmobiling and um you know i had a great opportunity to get to know guys like that working with polaris and um so he's like yeah let's let's do tailgate this year like come out like my dad's got a motor home we can scrape together some sleds like it'll be easy you know so he really kind of inspired me to get out there and, um, and i'd also been talking to a guy named mark sullivan who uh started snowboard magazine um back in around the late nineties or early two thousands. And when he left, um, he sold snowboard magazine and started this event called tailgate Alaska on Thompson pass outside of Valdez. Um, and his vision for that was just to share this like magical place with people. And, uh, you know, the snowmobile was kind of the, the Holy grail of existence on the pass because you didn't need a helicopter really, you know, these mountains were at your fingertips on your own terms, um, on your own time. He had been telling me for a few years, like, you got to get up here. You got to get up here. It's <laughs> the coolest thing you'll ever do. And so I had been talking to some of these guys about it and, um, you know, we, we kind of rallied a crew. And so, you know, this was 13, I believe. So I started the Facebook page. We went out to Alaska. 
Um, I mean, I absolutely had my mind blown when I went to Alaska. Um, just the mountains are, are nothing like what I'm used to in Colorado and, you know, lower 48, uh, you know, there's these huge, just vast, um, almost sand dunes, like tilted up on an angle. And, you know, you could go up on slopes that you just can't touch in Colorado and Utah. And, um, you know, the snow is very dense and, um, but it's like that blower pow, you know, <laughs> so, uh, much more stable avalanche conditions. Um, and then there's no trees. So, you know, if you can point the sled up the hill and commit to it, you can pretty much go anywhere you want, um, which is just a, a dream come true for a, a snowboarder slash snowmobiler. And, uh, and I had some really, you know, probably some of the best guides that you could ever have uh, for that place. So had just an amazing experience with these guys and um, it really did change my life. And um, and so from there I was, you know, I was still like the fire had kind of been lit with the Facebook page and, and now I was making my own content and, um, had a lot of relationships with, you know, some athletes and media professionals across ski snowboard and, and snowmobile worlds and, um, just, uh, kept doing that and, and seeing that I had an audience going and not sure what I was going to do with that audience, but, you know, it made sense to just keep kind of letting this, this audience, this voice, this, uh, this stream of, of sharing and content, um, do its thing. So, um, you know, fast forward another year, I left the agency in, in 2014 and we had been pushing, uh, the snowmobile company to get in with, you know, some snowboard things. And so you're going to actually see Polaris, I think this year that uh, a video did get published last fall with uh, Travis Rice and and uh, Dan Adams. That was, uh, I think they called it Convergence. Um, awesome. My buddy uh, Fletch Omar uh, had the opportunity to kind of see the vision through and, and go out and they went out to Bald Face Lodge and uh, shot you know these two guys, uh, Dan and and Travis. And it's funny that you know Dan was one of our pro athletes and. I had brainstormed with him a lot over the years about this. And, um, so, you know, he, he told me, you know, back in, I guess, 08 or 09, whenever I met him that he was Travis Rice's snowboard coach. <laughs> and I, was, I was like, man, like we should do some content. Like it'd be so awesome, um, to just tell that story. And, you know, it's a, it's a great connective tissue for the snowmobile culture to, you know, skiing and snowboarding and, you know, I have this hunch um, based on a lot of relationships that I've had over the years that most, many, not most, but many snowmobilers, especially in the West, um, have a connection to skiing or snowboarding, whether they moved out to the Rockies to, to ski or snowboard and then got into sledding or if they're from the Midwest and were already exposed to power sports, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, a lot of people still had been coming out to Colorado or Utah as kids on, you know, family ski trips or whatever. Um, and I know quite a few, uh, pro snowmobilers who, uh, were ski racers and, and really into snowboarding. And that's really what got them here. And then, you know, they, they kept snowmobiling and it's kind of a cool progression that happened culturally. Um, you know, particularly over the last 15 years, um, you know, this backcountry trend is really, uh, blown up in skiing and snowboarding and, and with snowmobiling, I mean, the backcountry really is the only place where you're allowed to do this activity. And, um, the mountains are such a constant variable challenge that, you know, always throwing something at you, whether it's weather or snowpack or terrain or, um, any combination of the above. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of cool to see the progression of the sport and the culture kind of happening, but it was in these, like, th these different silos of, of, you know, human-powered adventures and, you know, power sports world, and the, the industries weren't really collaborating with one another, and, uh, you know, they're really in these siloed industries where the ski industry cares about what the ski industry is doing, and, you know, the media and the manufacturers are all kind of doing their thing, and then, 
snowboarding is its own world, doing its own thing, its own culture, language, media, products, and the same with the sled industry. Um, what was interesting about sledding, you know, well, actually, I'll, before I say that about sledding, what was interesting about skiing and snowboarding, you know, I grew up in the early days of snowboarding where we were really the outlaws, you know, the skateboarders on the, on the ski slopes. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was really before there were snowboard parks and, um, we'd get a lot of, a lot of shit from, uh, patrollers and, you know, I swear I'd lose my ski pass two or three times a year at steamboat and, <laughs> you know, whether we were, you know, all laying up onto picnic tables or jumping ropes or ducking ropes or whatever we were doing to try to um, get some interesting terrain in front of us. Uh, it never really lined up with the, the ski uh, rules. <laughs> so, you know, and a lot of people didn't really welcome us. And, um, but that had evolved over the years. So it was kind of cool to see skiing and snowboarding start to adopt each other. And then of course, you know, the Olympics happened and X games grew and all these things. And so I'd say skiing and snowboarding have come a long way as far as the, these two cultures, like really an industry is really accepting one another and working together. Um, whereas the sled world, completely different world, um, very much rooted in the Midwest. Uh, when I started working with Polaris, um, that industry is very, uh, I'd almost call NASCAR like race, mm -hmm. uh, cultural sensibility where, you know, checkered flags and racing stripes and, um, you know, kind of, uh, not, not exactly the, the Southern California surf inspired <laughs> culture that, that, um, you know, board sports had kind of created. So definitely some very different, uh, sensibilities between these cultures. And, um, so how do you bring these worlds together and, you know, when I started Backcountry United, it was really like, how do you bring these worlds together? And, you know, selfishly, like, what does that look like from uh, how do you create more industry, more sales growth? You know, and that's really the only lens that I was looking at it through. Um, so, you know, coming back around, I actually left the agency world in the fall of 14. Um, I just had to try something else. And um, I didn't really have a plan. I'm total right brain creative <laughs> living, just winging it in the world. And, you know, I've got a wife and three kids at home and, um, financially just, I wasn't going anywhere with the agency and, um, I, I needed to take some risks and see, you know, just see what it looks like on the other side of that comfort threshold. And so I kind of quit my job without really thinking it through. And when they asked me what I was going to do, I was like, uh, I guess I'm going to build Backcountry United. And I think everybody thought I was nuts. And, um, but, I mean, really, it, it was what I needed to do. And, and it was really funny because uh, the moment that after I uh, walked out of my, my boss's office and went back to my desk, this email popped up from our biggest competitor that it was a press release that they were announcing this partnership with uh, – a leading snowboard brand and, <laughs> um, and it's just like oh you know it's totally how the universe works like yeah. you know you stick it out as long as you can and then um, the moment that you you let off you know something breaks through and um, but you know it's good because it, it just solidified um, validated a lot of the things that I've been pushing for many years and um, gave me some confidence to to move forward and, and keep trying to, to build this dream. And, um, uh, Dan Adams, the athlete I was telling you about, he had, uh, connected me with some friends of his that were developing products for him. And, uh, you know, we started talking around the same time and they liked my ideas and they were like, well, you know, if, if this emerging market is as big as you think it is, um, we'd love to, collaborate with you and, and see what we could create together and so I started just sketching a bunch of ideas and um, one of my ideas was a uh, kind of a new take on the, the snowboard ski rack on the back of a sled um, something that people hadn't really done before I'd seen it kind of makeshifted like you know some people would bungee cord their skis or their board to the back of the sled in this positioning but nobody had really engineered a 
um, a rack that, you know, kind of made it easier. And um, so sketched that out and had some other ideas, shared them and um, they started prototyping. And uh, by the following spring, uh, I had some prototypes that we took to Alaska. So this was now our third year in Alaska in Valdez and uh, tested the products and just, it just blew me away. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. I was uh, in with Randy Sherman. We were driving from uh, Anchorage to Valdez, which is like a eight or nine hour drive. We're like in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, Oh shit. He's uh, what? I was like, you know, I don't think we ever thought about skis going into this rack. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I kind of showed up in Valdez like, man, I don't know if this is going to work, you know. And um, luckily, there's all sorts of people that kind of give me feedback. And, uh, you know, there were skiers and snowboarders there that we were, you know, putting their gear on the machine and shuttling people up the mountain. And um, actually got feedback from a guy named Regis Roland, who's like one of the original pioneers, like European uh, big mountain snowboard pioneers. He's done a lot of product development and stuff. And, you know, so it's just cool, like, the energy that kind of surrounded um, creating this product and, and getting the feedback and kind of ironing out some of the kinks. Um, we came to market within a year of a sketch. And, uh, you know, we got quite a few units out all over, uh, you know, the lower 48, a um, little bit in British Columbia and uh, quite a few in Alaska. So... You know, they're in consumers' hands. We're, we're getting great feedback. And, um, you know, people are sharing their, their content to our social media. And, um, and so that's all been going really great as well. Um, and then I guess, you know, the other piece that I've kind of left out, I, I kind of went down the path of, like, how I got to the product. Um, but with the brand, if I backtrack to 14, when I left the agency, I ended up um, in another opportunity as a creative director for an agency, smaller agency. And uh, the first client that I got to kind of dig in with was the United States Forest Service, uh, the White River National Forest. That's really cool. Um, as a new client. And so here I am coming from 10 years of working in corporate and power sports and this and that. And, and now I'm sitting in a, a boardroom in Minturn, Colorado with all these like, uh, you know, rangers and, and, <laughs> Um, directors of you know different districts of the Forest Service and um, listening to their pain points and their their strategies and goals and um, trying to understand what how we could help them from a creative you know messaging communications perspective and um, learned a lot about some of the challenges that uh, our our public land uh, managers are going through uh, from, you know, everything from budgetary, uh, constrictions that are happening and, you know, they're losing a lot of, um, their, their manpower. I mean, their budgets have been cut. We've got huge forest fire epidemic that's, that's happened. And, you know, a lot of their monies are going toward fighting forest fires in the summer. And, um, meanwhile, you know, a lot of people know what like national parks and, you know, Yosemite or, or Yellowstone, stuff like that. But a lot of people don't know, especially in urban um, environments, that there are these public lands where you can, you don't have to pay. You, you pull off on a dirt road and you can go camp in the middle of nowhere and, and really enjoy a pretty wild experience. Um, and, you know, a lot of people just don't know that uh, like Forest Service and BLM lands are available for uh, the types of activities that, that you can do on those, in those lands, you know, things such as mountain biking, fishing, hunting, camping, um, you know, recreational vehicles, even like, you know, towing a, an Airstream trailer into a place to camp. Um, and then, you know, where that really affects my sensibility is, uh, you know, snowmobiling, uh, ATVs, stuff like that. This is really the only place, uh, in, in the world really that we can ride these machines and, and kind of get away from civilization society. And, um, so there's kind of this misunderstanding going on between these cultures that, 
are, you know, getting into the backcountry on foot versus those who are getting out there um, using motors and, um, you know, even mechanized. And, um, you know, another thing that's going on out there is uh, wilderness is really gaining a lot of steam, which, you know, pers my personal opinion is I believe we need wilderness. Um, the definition of wilderness is that we're, uh, we have lands that are untrammeled by man, um, where natural habitats remain. And, um, absolutely think that that's a valuable thing to do and, and glad that so many people are working hard to set aside more wilderness designation. Um, but one of the problems with wilderness designation is that, uh, there is nothing um, besides just your own two feet that are allowed on those lands. So even like wheelchairs, mountain bikes, uh, you know, there could be a, a road um, system that's built into an area that people have been accessing for, you know, a hundred years. And, um, you know, if somebody decides that uh, a sagebrush or a, you know, a, I don't know, <laughs> a mouse who lives in the area is like, you know, endangered, like everybody freaks out and they, they close down millions of acres without really um, consulting with all of the, all of the parties that really um, enjoy these, these public lands. You know, these are our public lands. They're owned by the greater, you know, the people of America, our tax dollars maintain and support these lands. And um, so we're, we're losing access to a lot of that stuff. So, um, my experience with the Forest Service really uh, helped me see a lot of that stuff that was going on and, you know, how do we look at it in a way that is sustainable because knowing that they have to manage all of these things, you know, everything from natural resource extraction, uh, timber, watershed, mineral, uh, you know, energy, all these things that, uh, commodities that support our our civilization um, to recreation, which um, recreation is the third largest economic driver in our country. So very important um, for them to kind of like, they have to juggle all of these uh, interests on these lands. And um, meanwhile, there's, there's so many people in the, in urban environments that, you know, that's where all the voting power and that's where all the money comes from. But, many people are just not attached to these open spaces. And um, it's kind of tragic because the backcountry is really, uh, the public lands are really like our last real asset uh, to freedom, which is kind of a crazy thing to say and think about. But um, you think about the people who pioneered the West, um, that, that spirit of individuality and fortitude to, you know, punch out and kind of, you know, brave the elements and, and find new horizons. Um, it's a very American ideal. And um, I think our public lands are really the, the last place where we can realize that, that human spirit and um, very much what it means to be an American. Like, you know, you can't, there's no such thing as, uh, you know, in Europe, you can't just get on a snow machine in Switzerland and, you know, go explore the mountains. It's, it's just, it's frowned upon. It's, there's so much uh, concentration of civilization. Um, so many factors that just, you know, you can't do that sort of thing in Europe, for instance. Um, and so I just kind of found a crusade in, in that, like, how do you uh, keep these lands open and, you know, keep these different people who, you know, disagree on fundamental things like how you travel on, on the land. Um, and then how do you get these people to respect one another and kind of work together, even though some people are, you know, just really irritated by the noise of, of the machines and, you know, some, some machines and some people are, you know, will cross boundaries and kind of tear things up a little bit. And so there's some like cultural perceptions to overcome and, um, so there's that. And then, you know, another <laughs> pain point that I wanted to try to uh, raise awareness around was this avalanche education and awareness. Um, again, thinking about it from a greater backcountry community, uh, our 
human powered people and our motorized people use the same places, go to the same places, yet look at the terrain completely different. Um, and then moreover, when you have these different, uh, different types of users out there in avalanche country, um, you know, there's one thing to understand how to navigate it and be safe on your own and with your own party. But then when you consider like, you know, the Wasatch in, in Utah where it's very congested and like right there up against the city, you've got a lot of people getting out into the backcountry that are on the same slopes with one another. And, um, you know, you add machines to that and it, it just, it could get crazy pretty fast. So, how do you get all these cultures to kind of pay attention to one another, understand the dynamics of, you know, how the, how the snow loads on, on the terrain and where the terrain traps are and have respect for others on slope. And, um, you know, you wouldn't want to go up on a slope on a snowmobile if, you know, a couple of guys were skinning up, you know, to ski it or, um, or if you're at the top of the mountain rolling over into you know, steeper terrain and there happens to be people below you. Like, what does that mean for their safety or, um, a guy named Drew Hardesty with the Utah Avalanche Center did a, I don't know if you saw the, it's called the forecaster. I didn't um, see that now. Black Diamond uh, produced it last year. Um, really great short film about, um, the idea of social responsibility and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of ski areas for instance, where, the the side country the out of bounds skiing you know you you exit a gate or whatever and um you ski some untracked snow that dumps you out onto a highway you know so like people are actually like driving on the highways beneath some of the the back country lines people are skiing and um so you just there's a lot to consider when you think of um you know your safety and, and other safety uh, in, in these places as far as avalanche, uh, terrain and conditions go. So, um, so that, you know, it's a lot of stuff, but really what I wanted to do with backcountry United, what started to come to life is like, yeah, there, there is this convergence of these different cultures coming together. Um, but more importantly, like how do we get all these people working together to keep themselves safe, keep their industries sustainable and growing? Um, you know, it's kind of a, a precarious ecosystem, if you will, of, you know, these industries that support this like, um, niche, uh, community and, you know, they all kind of rely on each other to be able to go out and pursue the things that we do. Um, so backcountry United has kind of boiled together into this, this essence of like bringing culture and industry together to, um, create sustainability for for what we do. Um, so really like that's what I'm building this brand on. And, um, and it's kind of funny because it's like, it's got this like social purpose to this brand that, um, you know, really what the brand stands for is just, it's an awareness. It's a, a campaign, a voice to just talk about this and, and get it out there. Um, but you know, with skins, um, my manufacturer, you know, that's an example of how, you know, I connected the brand with a manufacturer and we actually innovated to create some products together, um, you know, and, and I've been talking with some other uh, media producers as well recently about um, what kind of content we can make and to tell the story and bring athletes and influencers together to, to try to just change the change the game on uh change the story the the cultural mindset of um how people are thinking about what they do and how that impacts um their their access and everyone's access to, to these lands for generations to come so um you know essentially trying to do something where uh we can sell product and that and and create uh content and, and do other things that drive revenue but that revenue just goes right back into building the momentum of this brand gets people aware and, and working together and kind of opening some minds and um you know hopefully we can culturally bring people together and start to break down some of these uh misperceptions and, and silos that have 
kind of created themselves over the last, you know, couple of decades. So, um, yeah, and that's, that's really a, cool. That's a mouthful, right? But <laughs> I don't know yeah, if I and missed anything. I think that's uh, that's why this podcast is cool, is because um, it it really loans itself to what you're doing, and that you're you can't really fully articulate the the mission that you're on, um, you know, in a very easy way because it's a very difficult thing to do, mm-hmm. um, and it seems like there's a lot of kind of fronts that you're fighting. Um, and I'm just interested in like how how do you see yourself and Backcountry United like in a perfect world moving forward? Is there like a specific medium that you kind mm-hmm. of see yourself going more toward in order to kind of push more of this idea of being more at peace with not only the natural world but the people the other people that are in it and how everybody goes about using it? Because there's definitely that that aspect of everyone kind of sees the land as, as their own thing. And so when you get a lot of people out there, like you were saying, um, it can create a lot of tension because someone feels that it should be for this and someone feels that it should be for that. And it's trying to take those people, get them in, into a same room or at least having a conversation about, you know, right. their feelings about it and how to move forward so that this, you know, whatever you feel is, is kind of sacred or, what you connect with outside out in the mountains kind of stays there for more generations. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's got a few legs, uh, but I see it as, um, media product and really how that all comes together is collaboration. Um, and so, you know, I've got a vision of, you know, I've got all these connections in um, that are athletes and media producers, photographers, uh, videographers, stuff like that. So there's a lot of content that I I hope to be able to create here. Um, I've got some proposals out, so I'm hoping that kind of starts to get some traction and, and we get out and start making viral video content. Um, so that's really where we're at for this year. Um, you know, but I'm a my background is branding and creative direction. And, um, so as far as, you know, other people might have other ways of going about this, but the way that, that I express it is through, um, I want to, I want to create a brand that's cool for me to wear, you know, like, um, think of all the brands out there and what they stand for. Uh, like Tom's is a great example of when you buy a pair of Tom's, you're not just buying a pair of shoes because they look cool. You're buying a pair of shoes because you know that the company is actually going to put another pair of shoes on somebody else, um, you know, without the same means that you have on the other side of the planet. Um, Or like North Face, for instance, like, you know, think of all the people in New York City that probably go in and buy a, a down jacket and they're never once going to go out into the, the outdoors, but they're buying this story, um, this narrative about, uh, you know, when I wear this logo, it actually stands for that I'm, you know, an adventurer in spirit. And, um, so it's kind of the same thing, you know, backcountry United, like, I don't want to, as far as I know right now, of course this might change, but the way that I've set myself up now is I don't want to get into being in the nonprofit world. Um, I would rather make things bring value to culture do cool stuff with, you know, people that I, I would love to work with and let that influence uh, the audience um, to the point that the audience, their demand and their conversation starts to change and bubble up. And that's what influences politics and, and their vote and where they spend their money. Um, and I think that, you know, in today's age, there's so many brands that, that prove that if you build a brand on a campaign platform, and you give people what they're looking for and it resonates with, with what they really want, um, out of, you know, an industry or a company. Um, there's more power in that as far as driving, uh, economics and and spending and, um, you know, the, the collective mindset of the community. So, so for now, I think that's kind of the direction that, that Backcountry United is heading in. And, you know, I've got a lot of other ideas of, of how to affect this change. Um, 
once we start to get some momentum. But, you know, one of, one of the big things that I'd love to do would be to create like a summit or a conference in a, you know, an amazing place um, where we bring like avalanche education, um, educators, industry leaders, you know, uh, leading athletes, media producers, publishers, um, and you bring them all into the same room. And even if they don't all see eye to eye, you get those varying perspectives on, you know, specific topics such as, you know, land stewardship, avalanche education, uh, you know, communities working together. Um, and, you know, that's what influences how the industries, you know, thrive and, and kind of uh, cohabitate and, and push into the future. Um, because right now it's just so siloed, like everybody's still doing their own thing. And, you know, I think um, America is this like melting pot, right? And like, I think that this is the only place in the world where you could bring so much diversity into one place. And um, I don't know, imagine what the human endeavor looks like in a hundred years from now, if, if we can continue to uh, grow and thrive in the spirit, like, you know, imagine a hundred years ago, like bringing somebody into current time and like showing them somebody on a, on a snow machine, like, you know, going off into, you know, it's like, you feel like you're on the moon sometimes, or, um, <laughs> you know, imagine somebody coming from the past and seeing, you know, a guy like, jumping off the top of a mountain with a wingsuit or, you know, all of the things that, that action sports have kind of like proven um, that we can defy, you know, gravity and nature and, and really like overcome amazing things. Like, God, imagine what we'll be doing in a hundred years from now, if we can continue to like work together and, and hopefully still have public lands to, yeah. you know, explore and, and have that kind of freedom. So. And I, th I think that's a really cool goal to have and a really awesome kind of vision to keep in mind. And it very, it very much keeps you on track when you're going through a lot of crap day to day that, you know, you might not necessarily want to be a part of, or that's stressing you out. It's nice to have that overarching thing to say like, this is where I'm going. And even though today might suck, you know, there's going <laughs> to be days down the line where things are going to work out. And I actually had this, um, a conversation like this with, uh, um, a creative director that I was working with recently. Um, and we were talking about like, as a designer, you kind of start out in this world where you're working on your own skills and you're working on how to develop your own talents. And then you kind of get to this position where you're posed the question of, do I want to start to take on more responsibility as it relates to helping other people mm -hmm. and kind of directing more instead of getting into the nitty gritty. And the way that he phrased it was, um, you kind of start off with more hard skills and you have to develop more soft skills, more mm -hmm. people skills and kind of learn how to meander that way. So as a designer <clears throat> for you, what was it like jumping from mm -hmm. you know, that, that world of like constantly, you know, putting in your headphones and just plugging in and kind of like letting it all flow. And then all of a sudden having to like deal with all these conflicting pieces of arguments and like, you know, <laughs> people stuff. Cause that's, mm -hmm. I think what's difficult for me is like when I get met with a lot of those challenges, it's, it's not like a challenge in design where you can kind of piece it together um, in a, in a very linear way. It seems like with people, it's more, um, more adaptive and you kind of have to pay more attention to situational type stuff. Right. Yeah. Design is, is a funny thing because you know, it's art, it's subjective. It's um, you know, I've seen some pretty crappy designs uh, <laughs> make it to the, the top of the world. Um, and, you know, and it's all based around the cell, like the concept, like how it's articulated. Um, and then the channels you go through to, to kind of rally everybody around that vision or that cause. Um, you know, it's the story that leads you to the, the design versus the design itself uh, as far as, you know, most of the experience that I've had in the past, um, you know, and then the corporate environment is, is an interesting scenario too, because, you know, um, a lot of your, your design briefs and the objectives that come to you are devised from groupthink. You know, you've got these committees on both the client side and the, 
um, the agency side and everybody's getting to a place of alignment to give the designer or the art director or the copywriter some direction to build on. Um, but it's funny because it's subjective. By the time it reaches the creative, um, it's all kind of subjective. And, you know, of course they try to build as many, uh, hard reference points and, you know, uh, uh, sorry, like, you know, quantitative types of uh, metrics into, you know, here's where we are, here's the situation, but this is where we're going. And if we succeed, then we'll see an uptick, you know, in these ways and, you know, always trying to measure something. But when it goes to the designer, I mean, if somebody gave me a logo design project and gave you the same project, I'm sure we would come up with completely different solutions. And, who's to say what's more beautiful, uh, you know, and it comes back down to like how you talk about it and, and how people can kind of get behind it. So, um, you know, it is interesting coming from that background and, you know, I'd say one of the things that really, I got the experience and then I had to figure out, okay, like there's gotta be something more than just doing it this way. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the agency uh, experience is, is such a trip because you've always got, you know, 20 voices in your head of, okay, if I make this move, then what's, you know, the account guy or the strategy girl going to say? And, and then you try to like, you know, get ahead of the feedback that you think you're going to get. And so you have all these voices in your head and you, you keep pushing and you create different versions of it and then you present it and, you know, and then hopefully somebody likes something that you did, but if they don't, then you're back to the, the drawing board. And um, what really led me to make the moves that I started to make was that I 99% of the work that I was doing was uh, going in the trash can, you know, not because it wasn't good work. It was just, that's the process, you know, that's the committee, the group think kind of process that your work goes through. And, um, you know, and when you're working, especially like in a cultural type of world where you're creating to resonate with a specific culture based on their, their language and their mindset. And, you know, all the people that you work with are more, um, they're more business and executive and they're less connected to the culture. They're more connected to the economics of it. Um, you know, it gets kind of frustrating as the designer because you're trying to like, you know, let them have something authentic so they can connect to the culture. But at the same time, you know, it's got to move the needle for their business objectives. I got to the point where I was just like, you know, imagine if I just did something for myself and, you know, I was the one who approved the work and, you know, it would be a lot of forward momentum. So, you know, now that I'm an entrepreneur, it's interesting because I actually miss all those voices, all that <laughs> because it really does temper your work. And, and I think it does make, make your work better. But on the same, in the same token, like um, I can make a decision like that. I can write a block of copy and publish it and feel confident in what I'm saying and who I'm speaking to. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of liberating from that perspective as well. Um, you know, starting Backcountry United, back to your point of like getting more into the world of directing something and, and kind of stepping away from the nitty gritty. Um, you know, I am I'm trying to build a team around this and I've actually brought other designers in to create some of our t-shirt graphics and stuff like that purposefully to kind of take my own uh, subjectivity out of the vision and kind of let the community start to express themselves uh, through this brand vision as well. Um, so yeah, it's like sometimes I, I just need to let go <laughs> and, and I get to a better place that way. But then there's other times where I really do have to kind of tap back into my, my hard skills. So you called it and um, you know, knock out a brochure or <laughs> something like that. So it's uh, yeah. But yeah, the soft skills are huge. I mean, that's how you connect with others and that's how you share your vision. And, um, 
you know, Backcountry United for me is not about me. It's really about everybody else who I um, connect with and care about their experience. And, you know, how do you, how do you create something that is really uh, shaped and adopted by a community? Um, you know, it's kind of daunting sometimes to, to know that that's where I want this to go. And I'm still, you know, in this early startup phase. So, yeah. And, but I think, uh, and I had heard this quote from someone else before. I'm not sure where it was, but, um, it was like something along the lines of if you're, if your goal, uh, can't be, or if your goal can be accomplished in your lifetime, it's not big enough. So I think (laughs) having, having those things that scare you or the goals that scare you really, really kind of keep you going because, um, you never really truly get there and there's always something else to do. Um, and, and yet, like, like you were talking about with the, the agency side of things, I think one big thing that the agency does give you that, um, is kind of a very hard transition into like, quote unquote, the real world, um, when you're working by yourself is you have more of a safety net around you when you're in the agency side, you know, if, if something happens where a part of the business goes downhill, you know, yeah. there, there are people there that can help navigate that and you work together as a team to get through it. Whereas when you're by yourself, it's, it's not as clear where you're going, you're doing it by yourself. Um, you kind of have those little minor freak out moment, moments yeah. a little bit more. Um, well, success and failure is all on you, you know? Yeah. Have you had anything like that um, kind of so far where, where there was like one moment where you were like, wow, that either, either, you know, it felt like a very heavy moment or, you know, some, something changed. I think there's a lot of times when you can look back and say, you know, I, this happened on this day and it definitely shifted where I was going, but you know, I'm better for it now. Right. No, I'd say every day I go through (laughs) um, an extreme high and an extreme low. Um, you know, some days I have higher highs and other days I have lower lows. Um, but you know, really like having that unattainable goal, (laughs) so to speak, like I'll never be done. And, you know, regardless of what I have to do to survive and take care of my family, um, there will always be even something small that I can do to just keep pushing the ball forward. Even if I kick the ball, like half an inch forward (laughs) today. like that's progress, you know? And, um, so that just, even that idea in itself keeps me going because surely there's days where I'm just like, Oh man, I'm broke. I spent all my money. Maybe I shouldn't have spent that much money doing this or that. Um, but then I'll get a phone call from somebody or an email or, uh, or like I, you know, there was one day, one of my highest days this year was, um, I went up on Vail Pass like late in the season. It was a big powder day. And, um, you know, and it's like I'm justifying my my snowboarding mission <laughs> as like, you know, tax write-off now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm going up there because it's content. But, I mean, let's face it. I'm going out there to have fun, <laughs> right? And uh, we saw three different crews up on the pass that were using um, the Backcountry United snowboard rack. That's really cool. And, uh, you know, I went up to each one of them. It was just like, nice. Like, how'd you get that? Like, where'd you get it? What do you think? And everybody was just so stoked. And like, I can't believe this didn't exist before. And, oh, you're the guy? Like, wow, I heard he was a local. You know, that's <laughs> so cool. Like, um, do you have any stickers, you know? Or like my my mom or like some friends or whatever have, like multiple people have like called me or sent me texts where, you know, they were in Salt Lake or, in steamboat and they saw my sticker on the back of a car and uh or a t-shirt somebody wearing a t-shirt or you know just little things like that um where it makes it real and people are stoked and you know it just it just keeps pushing it forward and um so you know and then there's there's awesome moments where you know we just got a big order on racks from a major distributor in the united states and um, you know, and they, they both, they liked the product, but they also loved the mission that we were on. And that kind of affirmed that the brand direction and the product innovation are both, um, relevant and compelling to people. So, you know, I get, I get these little moments of affirmation and, um, and it's really awesome. And, you know, I'd say, uh, I definitely can't do it with, 
without a lot of people that are supporting me. And, um, you know, I'd like to give them a shout out whenever that's appropriate. Too. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely, definitely do that at the end for sure. Cool. Um, so I think, um, like in the, in the grand scheme of things, um, it's, it's kind of easy to sit here where we are right now and look back and say, I went through all of this stuff in order to get here. Um, you know, you're always kind of at that like nexus of all of this happened in order for me to do what I'm doing right now. Right. And I think the hard thing when a lot of people are either in earlier stages of their career or just younger in general is like they have these goals of wanting to do bigger and better things. Um, and they might not necessarily have the connections or the, the kind of history, the career history to back that up. Um, right. And so it's, it, I have this theory that like you, you kind of have to start off a little bit more selfish um, and hopefully eventually somebody kind of kicks you in the ass and wakes you up and says, you know, like, what are you going to just keep doing this for the rest of your life? Where does, where does that path kind of end? Um, right. How, like, how did that kind of show up with you? Like at what point yeah. or, or, or how did that happen where all of a sudden you were kind of like, this needs to, I need to help other people instead of just kind of like, continuing my own thing by myself totally um i don't know it's uh it is funny because it's a process i think everybody has their own path and their own story and um their own kind of moments of revelation where they you know decide that this is where i'm at this is where i'm going like i don't like the trajectory i'm on so how do i mix it up and do something different and um you know it's like i had to I don't know. I've seen a lot of people who have grown a lot faster than me in one way or another, whether it's athletic or career or, you know, as artists or, um, you know, I've, I've got, I've, I think a lot of people probably have this problem where you compare yourself to others and, you know, I've seen people that I've, you know, early in my career, I taught them, you know, how to use illustrator and now they're like vice president, <laughs> creative directors at, you know, big agencies or, um, you know, or, I mean, I experience every time I go to the skateboard park, I'm 40 years old and I still try to skate and, you know, I see these kids, you know, eight year old kids that are like better than any pro skateboarder of my, my childhood, <laughs> and, you know, so I, I think I get frustrated when I see people who, you know, it comes a lot easier to them or so I perceive. And, um, so that's been kind of a part of, of my, my path and my progression is, um, you know, seeing how other people have progressed and where am I in my life and how can I justify that I've actually succeeded at anything. And, um, but you kind of got to strip all that away and, and not be so hard on yourself. You know, selfishness goes both ways. It, you know, there's, there's a greed side to selfishness, but there's also kind of a, uh, a harshness as far as, you know, being very critical of yourself and, um, you know, I'm kind of a perfectionist and I always want to be better and, and try to be better. But if it's not good enough, sometimes I'll, you know, throw in the towel. And um, so this whole entrepreneurship thing has been good for me in the sense that I, you know, I've created something that will never end. Like I can just <laughs> always like chip at it, chip away at it and feel good that, you know, it's connecting with other people around the world. Like that's cool keep pushing it forward, you know? Um, but I can also see clearly that, you know, a lot of the things that I kind of, uh, hit roadblocks with that I could never get over those humps. Um, just opening myself up to other people's input and, um, you know, humbling myself to allow for, uh, you know, even when you get criticism from a friend and it seems like they're just being an asshole, <laughs> but really they're, just, they're trying to tell you like, you got to, you got something in your teeth, dude, you know, like just little stuff like that. Like, um, to be able to take that feedback and, and, and become better based on, you know, how other people interact with you. And, um, again, like this whole thing wouldn't be where it's at right now unless I had opened up to, to where other people could, could help me take it, you know? So I definitely miss the team environment of the agency. Um, the people who, 
who would push the work and push me and ask me questions and, you know, sometimes tell me it sucks and, um, you know, it's good to have that feedback and that, that humility to, to just take it and, you know, let it make you better. So I don't know if I answered your, I don't know (laughs) if I answered your question, but. No, you totally did. And I, I have, I always have a lot of boogers too. So I really appreciate (laughs) when, when friends are willing to call me out and tell me I look like an idiot. So (laughs) I, I totally understand that in, uh, in your perspective, where is kind of that fine line of, of being able to listen to others and kind of take their criticisms, but also kind of get rid of the points that you think don't make sense. Because I think that's one, totally. one big piece of, of being creative in whatever way it is, like, you know, whether it's us as designers or, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that people can be creative, whether that's with numbers or with business or, right. you know, whatever you kind of throw yourself into where, where is that line and how do you find it of being able to take other things and then put your own spin on it and, you know, kind of like keep going back and forth. Yeah. Um, I would call that uh, time. <laughs> and, you know, I, I say a lot, I'm going to sleep on it. Um, you know, some people pray or meditate. Um, I think I probably do both. You know, I tend to have a process where, I'll have a conversation and if it makes me uncomfortable, I know there's some value there. Um, And if I have time to be able to sleep on it, pray on it, meditate on it, you know, bounce it off of some other people, get feedback. um, I'll take as much time as I possibly can to make any, any of those types of decisions because um, you know, for me, my creative process Uh, tends to come to life when I'm half awake and half dreaming like early in the mornings Mm -hmm. um, where you know I'll go to sleep with this just burning perplexity on my mind and uh, you know I'll wake up with with some pretty good clarity about like how to how to make a call on that and it doesn't mean that it's always right or always wrong but there is a point where you have to be decisive and Um, you know, it might take me six months or it might take me two days or it might take me an hour, um, depending on what the question is or what the, you know, what kind of answer I'm seeking. But, um, I mean, Backcountry United took me 10 years to, you know, and I still didn't even know what the hell it was when (laughs) I had a logo and a Facebook page, you know, it was just, it was just a thing that I had to express or, or bring together. And, Um, it's just like, it's kind of like a painting, you know, if you're sitting there looking at a blank canvas and you don't know where to start and you don't have, or you don't have any inspiration, but you know, you want to create something. Sometimes all you have to do is put the the brush in the paint and put a line on, on the canvas and build from there. You know, sometimes you don't know which, which way you're going and you just have to do something. Um, and once you get that, once you get that moving, keep that momentum going and, and, and not regret, you know, <laughs> the decisions that you make to get there, you know, which is hard as an artist because I mean, I don't even, I don't have any tattoos for instance, you know, I never wanted oh, to go. I, I am the complete opposite of yeah. you in that regard. <laughs> I always had a problem getting a tattoo because I'm an artist and do I want somebody else's art on my body? And, mm-hmm. but then, you know, as an artist, I knew that everything that I would ever create, as soon as I was done creating it, I hated it. (laughs) (laughs) So I had this like, um, conundrum where it was just like, okay, but now, now that I'm kind of enlightened and I've been through a lot of this experience and I'm bringing others into my success, I could actually see getting a tattoo as long as it meant something. And the artist who was doing it was, way more awesome than I'll ever be, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So, but yeah, I I think it is hard to, to find those decision points and, and stick to them and, and not have regrets like once they're set in stone. And, you know, I think where I find the most confidence in making those decisions um, tends to be rooted in, um, you know, what's my gut reaction is kind of the, you know, like for instance, I don't, I rarely take notes. Mm-hmm. 
and the reason for doing that is it allows me to be more engaged in the conversation. But, um, you know, after a couple of days go by, what are the things that stand out in my head as being the most pertinent? Those are probably the headlines of the story. And that's where I'll focus my attention, you know? Yeah. Um, I do a, yeah. I have kind of like a similar process too, um, where I'll do the same thing. I really want to pay attention or at least try my best to pay more attention to people in the moment. Um, and then what I tell other people to do is write things down kind of as you're like going through them in your head, because what happens to me, and I'm not sure if this is kind of similar to you or not, but I always have all these ideas going on. And so if I don't get at least part of that idea out and put it down, it ends up going away. Um, mm -hmm. and then what I'm able to do with it once it's down on paper is kind of like, as more thoughts come in. I can start to kind of group the thoughts that I've put down and it, yeah. it kind of like it, it creates that like roadmap for you of, of what your head's kind of trying to push out mm -hmm. um, that you can't really fully pay attention to in a single idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend to, again, I'll wake up, you know, three, four or five o'clock in the morning um, very frequently and, you know, pull up my iPhone with the, the notes app <laughs> and I'll just start, you know, I'll just get all this stuff out of my head and, um, it's, it's cleansing for one, you know, it allows me to kind of let go of a lot of stress and tension. Um, but really like that's where, you know, the confidence of those thoughts and ideas really, um, manifest themselves. And then I can shoot that as an email to somebody or to myself. And then once they're kind of there, I can start building on them. So, um, you know, another point of confidence that I find too is, and this kind of goes back to that selfish uh, genesis evolving into a selfless purpose, um, is if I'm struggling about like what, what the idea is, I'll ask myself, um, if I go one way or the other, is how's it helping other people? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll use that as kind of my my final uh, qualification, I guess, for making a decision. And, you know, especially when it comes to not regretting your decisions, um, you know, when you think, think about anything that you do through the lens of other people and doing good for, for others, um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, armor on your idea or, or on your decision because you know you can kind of justify rationalize the mm -hmm. thought uh, or it's not even necessarily armor but uh just kind of what you had talked about a little bit ago with being more um less having less regret with the decision it kind of as you go forward and you keep that in mind when you make decisions if something goes wrong you can look back and be like well even though that didn't work out it was kind of my only option because it was it was what i felt was the right way to go and it didn't work and now i can you know put it behind me and keep going mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think uh you know life is full of compromises um but there are some things that you can't compromise on and that's where you know your values and and kind of mission statements if you will uh, really give you that long-term guide, you know, of, of how you operate and um, seek opportunities and, and such. So, yeah, I think that's, that is what, one thing that's really liberating for me to have a long-term vision like this is that um, it really is a guide. It's a lens. It's, it's really my, my operating principles and, um, who knows like what could happen tomorrow like somebody could call me from a like a recruiter from a cool brand that needs a creative director a brand director or something that I would have never considered but I can kind of hold it up against the things that I value mm -hmm. and if that lines up with the way that they're operating then um, why the hell wouldn't I do that <laughs> you know or vice versa if you know a really cool opportunity comes up and I hold my values up to that and they're they represent the antithesis of what I'm trying to do in the world, then you know that's an easy decision to make, even though you might be turning down a lot of money um, so but you have that clarity of like well yeah, they you know 
test those things on animals. Like, why would I do that? Or, you know, whatever, whatever that value or, um, anti value represents. So it seems like it definitely can make decisions easier when you get into the really, really hard stuff, which it, it, I think, uh, as you kind of get more to the core of what you want to do long term with your life, I think those decisions come up more and more. Um, and I don't know if that's if there's like a reason behind that or not, you know, some mm-hmm. big thing that we're not, you know, fully aware of. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting that like as you get further down or closer to kind of like the meat of what you want to do, those those big decisions come up where it's like, hey, here's some more money. Here's some more money. Like, why don't you come this way? And you're like, you have to really be able to right. understand whether or not that's the right decision or not. And I also think it's interesting that uh, with what you're trying to do and kind of what I'm trying to do with this podcast too, is like how much nature and being outside is a part of of getting to know more of that voice and kind of following it. Like how, for you, how how is that kind of played into, you know, the the grand scheme of what you're working on? Yeah, it's everything, man. Um, you know, I've I've expressed it this way as long as I can remember that the mountains are church for me. Um, you know, and I can go off on a lot of lot of spir- spiritual tangents with this, but um, when you really take an honest look at things, you know, nature is the only thing that's real in our in our lives, and. Um, you know, to experience nature is to experience, you know, truth and its essence. And, you know, we live in a world full of deceit and, and a lot of, uh, distractions and, um, temptations. And, you know, it's like you go out into the back country and it's just you against the mountain and you can either go with the flow and, you know, listen to the wind and pay attention to, you know, the weather and, and, you know, how things are, are forming and, and adapt to it um, and be humbled by it because you're going to lose if you know, <laughs> nature takes a wrong turn on you or if you make a stupid decision because you're not paying attention. Whereas, you know, in the, the quote unquote real world, um, I mean, you're at the mercy of, of a system of all sorts of different uh, superficial material things, you know, and, um, it's pretty funny how many entrepreneurs I've, I've heard from since I started this venture that if your ideas are good and, um, and you're selfless about the way that you approach it, the money is going to just show up, which, you know, I'm still waiting, on. (laughs) but, you know, I have seen proof that, you know, operating on purpose is actually a much more fruitful place to be um, than just chasing the money. You know, chasing the money means that you're just doing something typically for somebody else's uh, objective, which may or may not be your own. Um, And, you know, so, you know, this whole entrepreneur's path that I'm on is also very much a spiritual journey and um, very, it's very important to fight for humanity's connection with earth, with truth. You know, Um, I can't imagine living on a, in a place where you can't get out into nature easily. Um, So yeah, for me, it's just like, how can my my great great grandchildren still be able to go to the top of that mountain that my grandfather took me to um you know to go and pull a fish out of a stream or um you know be truly like humbled and in awe of of what you know nature only nature can create and so yeah i mean at its very core like that's probably what I'm trying to do. And, you know, for me, it's just manifested itself through my passion for, um, snowboarding. Really snowboarding has been at the core of that as far as the expression and, um, you know, and then the snowmobile unlocked a lot of those opportunities and 
and you know since i've started this and now that we've start we're starting to get a following on like instagram people are sharing their content with us you know we're seeing it come to life in so many other ways you know we're getting people tagging us in their you know nature hikes and you know fishing and boating and camping and rock climbing and mountain biking and you know you start to realize like how important the outdoors really are to our you know to humanity to you know everybody who are just like me and you that we just want to be outside and get away from you know this rat race <laughs> yeah. so so uh i think it's this is a difficult question and and one that i don't think really has an answer but so i've kind of gotten to a similar place as what where obviously you have just based on kind of how you just answered that but um mm -hmm. the the next issue for me after that comes in um like okay so i have this overarching goal now and i'm kind of like slowly taking steps to realize that and kind of help other people to realize that on their own terms how in the meantime how do i make sure that i'm not hurting more than i am working to better something so like in the terms of let's say in your situation where you're trying to create product or you you know what you have to do in the in the action sports industry or at least in the outdoor industry in order to get more content you have to travel a lot right. and so that inherently means putting more of a strain on the earth as far as, you know, using more fuel or, you know, sure. getting from point A to point B, this kind of thing. How do you see that in, in your own eyes? Like how, how do you kind of wrestle with that? Yeah. Um, I think it comes down to numbers. You know, I, you know, I grew up in a town um, that built itself on coal, for instance, and, you know, the community is very much uh, struggling right now because um, there's pretty hardcore environmentalist push on closing down this coal mine. And, um, you know, and regardless of if they've been able to, to do that yet or not, you know, the community is in distress because, you know, how am I going to, if I'm a coal miner, how am I going to take care of my family for the next 15 years if I don't know if I'll be employed in six months? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so it is interesting because there's got to be a point where we've potentially extracted too much uh, of our natural resources as a commodity. Um, but on the flip side, you know, I grew up in a town where there's a, uh, these two big stacks, like, you know, shooting into the air with uh, steam coming out of them. And, you know, and I've, I've lived in Denver now for 20 years. And I'll tell you that I've never seen more blue skies in my life than the town that was, you know, has a coal mine in the backyard. Um, I think that the problem is more when you compound civilization, when you stack everybody up into urban environments, um, I'd say traffic is probably a much larger issue in scale than, um, you know, people who are using motors to get into the back country. Um, you know, I know a lot of like, uh, pro skiers, for instance, you know, there's like protect our winners, um, mm -hmm. great organization, love what they're doing. Um, but of course there is a hypocritical side of what they're doing because many of their, their athletes are, you know, on airplanes year round flying around the world. And, you know, once they land, they have, helicopters and snowmobiles and more airplanes and you know and and they're promoting brands that are manufacturing plastic based products overseas that are just dis being distributed all over the country and i mean it there's just it's such a compounded complicated issue like environmentalism and mm -hmm. um you know do i want nature for myself and for my kids and generations to come absolutely uh but what's the responsible way of doing it i don't know the answers to those things because i'm not yeah. an expert but you know i i do think that there are much bigger problems um than people who are using snowmobiles to go into the backcountry um i mean the beef industry for instance like the methane that's produced from 
you know, industrialized like uh, dairy farms and beef um, production, like far outweighs the the environmental impact that you know a million snowmobilers put into the earth on their five to 10 trips a year, you know? Yeah. And that's um, always been a kind of a difficult thing for me coming from Wisconsin is that, you know, quite literally my entire family has come from the background of that type of farming. And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been vegan now for like six months ish. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's always an interesting conversation to have because, you know, there's always those, connotations of you know well you're trying to push it on other people this and that blah blah it's like, <laughs> right as long as it i think as long as it starts from a place of you wanting to help in the first place or just at least lessen what what uh kind of harm you're doing then, right. then uh, it's okay but i think the way that i typically look at that question and it's kind of similar to yours is that uh it's it was it kind of it, it comes down to uh i was i was talking with a friend the other day about uh um an artist and or i guess there's many of these types of people on instagram um an artist that that paints or draws more nature related stuff and is using that as kind of the the way to push the message that they're trying to get across which is the same thing as us that you know we need to kind of help out more do what we can lessen our impact and there was a lot of negative comments about, you know, if you really, if you really um, wanted to affect people, you would go out and, you know, do something more kind of related to the Tangible heart of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then, you know, paint or draw. And I think it, it, it's hard to explain to those people in a, in a calm way that uh you're doing what you can with the skills that you have you know you totally. can't just you can't if if you're if you're yeah, there's a role that art plays in in yeah. the world and in the conversation and you know provoking thought and creating conversation can be just as if not more powerful in many ways depending on who it connects with and how it influences their actions um you know and I mean, I could go in a lot of different ways, but, you know, I think that's how I can justify. And I've really struggled with it. Like, I, I'm very critical of what I'm doing in many ways. Like, sometimes I, I wonder if I should be more nonprofit and I should be, you know, going to D.C. to rally this and that. And, um, but then I come back to knowing, you know, that everything begins with thought. And if you can put the right thoughts out to the right people and influence the way that they then carry their conversation forward um that can actually you know within seven degrees to kevin bacon like <laughs> actually spread out pretty far and wide until you you really have made a difference and um but yeah there's more tangible things that we could do too like one of my far-fetched uh ideas that hell you never know could happen with backcountry united is um all right here you go here's one of my big innovations i haven't patented it yet so uh maybe elon musk is watching but what if we created an electric hover machine that basically floats above the ground above the snow it gives people the same access it's quiet um, but it doesn't tear up the the terrain and it puts out zero emissions would we yeah. would we then still have the same issues with this access you know and it's funny because i was just going to bring that up as uh another point is that the other way that i kind of look at that the sustainability aspect of things is like things don't happen overnight and in order for there to be more of a drastic change throughout a society as a whole you kind of have to have these ideas start sprouting so that people are able to make iterations of things and get to the point where it is sustainable. You know, we don't are, we don't go from having a, a gas vehicle to a perfectly functioning, fully working electronic vehicle. There are steps in between and like, until you're able to get there, you're right. going to have to wrestle with not being able to, or not being able to fully, you know, justify that being there. It's like, this is doing harm, but we are making steps in order for there to not be, so I, I think that's right. kind of like where you get some of the comfort in, in knowing that you're at least putting a foot forward. 
Yeah. It's always a process, you know, whether it's individual growth and progression or, you know, more of a societal growth and progression. But I mean, you think about like communications, for instance, I mean, how long has the human race been in existence? Like 200,000 years or something. And we just now like ended up with, uh, you know, the internet and computers. And then, you know, within 10 years of all that, like now we have these iPhones in our pocket with like, you know, everything at our fingertips. It's like, yeah, imagine if they could have just had the iPhone right away. Like <laughs> when Jesus was born, I mean, we <laughs> look, look how much better the world might've been, but you know, it's like we had to go through that process of, you know, chipping things into stone and then, Oh, now we have paper. And then, you know, to get us to the point of, you know, the communication age that we're in right now. So kind of a funny tangent, but yeah. Um, you know, your progress personally is a different process than my progress personally to get to where I'm going. And, um, but you know, I think we all have a purpose in what we're doing. And, um, I mean, I can't explain why the hell we're even on this planet or <laughs> all of that. That's probably another podcast, but, um, I do think everybody plays a unique role in, in how we perpetuate ourselves and, and, you know, hopefully find a, a more utopian existence. <laughs> um, but I think we're going to have to get through this, uh, this next presidency before we <laughs> <laughs> get there. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Uh, is there a, is there some some small tidbits of advice that you would give somebody that was kind of trying to follow a similar path you know like oh i because i think there's a lot of people now with uh, the technology that's out you know like the podcasts that we're doing right now where they're able to kind of be forced or at least pushed more into that direction of awareness and understanding that there's more people in the world than, the, than just them and that they can yeah. actually make more of a difference than they might have might have thought in a different age where the internet wasn't right beaming, beaming to them this idea you know immediately off the internet so i think there's a there's an interesting kind of space happening where there's a younger generation that are understanding these ideas more but don't necessarily have the experience or the understanding of like how to put that together so yeah. I guess is there is there anything that you'd be able to say to somebody like that that might be wanting to help but has no idea how to do it or like you know how could they help that country united as just a single person? Right. Um, so you know, selflessly, it's it's about the message. So really, what I'm trying to push to the community is um, to talk about you know the importance of public lands and really the importance of respecting other users in the backcountry um, and really carrying that conversation forward. Uh, you know, a tangible way to do that it would be to tag us in your Instagram and Facebook content that uh, showcases, you know, different uh, backcountry cultures kind of getting along and, and cohabitating, working together, recreating together. Um, so that's, that's the easiest way to uh, perpetuate our cause, I'd say, um, you know, if you're really passionate and you really want to get involved, I'm, I'm stoked to bring on anybody who wants to write or um, shoot, you know, whether still or video. Um, I personally need help when it comes to uh, operations, finance, <laughs> business plan, execution, stuff like that too, uh, project management. Um, so there's definitely roles that um, people could play as far as, you know, even entre or, uh, sorry, internship type of stuff. And, you know, once we start to get into revenue streams, like it can turn into uh, a paying gig for everybody is my hope. Um, and then uh, if you have relationships with outdoor companies that you see them fitting in well with what we're doing, um, we're definitely looking for collaborators there too. So, Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> is there Shame, a shameless is, request for help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Is there anyone else that you kind of want to get it, give a shout out to or, or yeah. anything else that you kind of want to say? I think um, we should, we're kind of at like the hour and a half ish. Yeah. Have right we been, 
Have I been talking that long? <laughs> I think we've both been talking that long. Okay. Glad you didn't put that all on me. <laughs> Man, that guy talks too much. No, uh, not at all. Um, you know, uh, all the people I worked with at the Integer Group and Polaris uh, definitely played a huge role in my thinking and, and helping me become the professional I am. Uh, the snowmobile industry has also been very supportive. Um, guys at Snow West and Skins Protective Gear and, um, you know, all of our athletes that I've gotten to know over the years. Uh, Randy Sherman, Dan Adams, Chris Barant, Matt Entz. Um, guy I could go on and on. Snowmobilers. Uh, one person who's played a huge role is uh, my friend Tana Hoffman uh, in Jackson. Um, she's been awesome. Wyatt Caldwell and Yancey Caldwell in the Sun Valley area. Todd Easterbrook, Todd Williams, Adam Brahmond. Um, man, so many people. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm forgetting dozens of people, but, you know, without all these people helping out, um, I think it'd just be me uh, beating my head against the wall. So <laughs> just uh, super grateful for, for everybody's support and, and even to you. Like, thanks for uh, bringing me on and um, – given me a, a space to tell my story and um, hopefully you and I can collaborate on some things in the future too. Yeah, definitely. And I'm hoping to get the, the podcast going a little bit more so that it can help out, you know, a little bit more than having currently zero viewers watching our live stream. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. Um, yeah. yeah. If people want to go check out the Backcountry United stuff, do you just want to tell them where they can find some of it? Yeah. Um, Backcountryunited.com is our uh, product website. And then uh, Instagram and Facebook at Backcountry United. So, and then you can uh, reach me directly at backcountryunited at gmail.com. Awesome. Sweet. Well, uh, if you have any other stuff that uh, you'd like to put in the show notes, you can let me know. I know you had kind of mentioned uh, that Forecaster film, which I'd actually like to check out myself. So I'll definitely try and put a link to that in the cool. show notes as well. Awesome. Sweet. Well, it's been cool. real. We're, we're going to have to schedule another one of these because that flew by. And I think they always do when you have really cool conversations. Yeah, man. No, that's super fun. Maybe, uh, maybe it'll get shorter next time. <laughs> you definitely <laughs> also, you one upped me with the background. I know that first time you were talking about how I had my snowboard back there and now you got some really sweet mountain pictures. So yes. I'm going to have to figure out something cooler next time. Nice. No, you've got a surfboard, so that trumps all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried. I placed it there on purpose. It didn't just happen. It didn't just happen to be there. Nice. Yeah, my wife, actually, she goes to thrift stores and finds um, paintings. And so, you know, sometimes they're like 50 cents or $10 or whatever, but we've got a pretty big collection of uh, thrift store mountain paintings and our house is starting to like really <laughs> fill up with them. So, well, you're going to have to let her know that I appreciate the ones that she got behind you. If she got you those. And if you yeah. have any more, definitely send them my way. Cause I'm down. Nice. <laughs> cool, man. I know what, uh, if I ever come and visit what the, uh, the housewarming gift will be. Definitely. Yeah. You'll <laughs> have to come visit. I mean, you were, you were right around here around Salt Lake before, but you know, Oh, I'm sure I'll be back around your area too at some point. Yeah, I drove past your house uh, about 24 <laughs> hours ago. <laughs> yeah, probably when I was on a river or something. <laughs> cool. But yeah, awesome. Appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, back at you, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye. All right, bye.